All right, yeah, guys, I think we're all here. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is a great turnout. Um, and so thank you all very much for, for joining in. Um, it's quite an honor to have you all here. Um, myself, Innocent and Lisa, it's a real privilege for us to share this with you today. This is a story that's very close to um, all of us, very close to our hearts. And um, we met differently um, on, on a trip independently last year. And through what has happened recently, we've, we came up with the idea to do what we, we are doing today. Um, and basically, the talk is, is structured in three parts. I'm going to open up just giving you a bit about the background and history and a little bit about Virunga National Park. And then Lisa is going to go on and share with us what it's like um, as an, the experience on the ground as, as a tourist and a traveler to Virunga. And then quite a rare opportunity to actually have somebody that's born and raised um, in the region that has known many of these rangers and employees in Virunga, gone to school with them and studied with them. Um, sadly, some of them have obviously been lost in the line of protecting Virunga. Um, so it's quite a, quite a pleasure and an honor to have Innocent also all the way from Gisenyi in Rwanda co-hosting with us today. So like I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the idea for all of this um, stemmed from a recent attack which happened in Virunga on the 24th of April. Um, a civilian vehicle unfortunately came under fire and attack by a rebel group called the FDLR and um, a convoy of rangers returning to the headquarters saw came across the scene and tried to protect the civilians and unfortunately 12 of the rangers for Virunga lost their life. So it was one of the deadliest attacks in the park's recent history and really this is the, the origin of, of why we're here today. And um, the rebel group in charge of this, you know, like I mentioned, FDLR, they, in short, they, a, a Hutu rebel offshoot, basically, that stems from the same people that were responsible for the Rwandan genocide that fled into the DRC and are still quite active, however, in very low numbers um, within the North Kivu province in the DRC. This is not the only event. But this particular end event, it won't undermine the efforts of Virunga National Park. Um, what they're doing in the region is truly exceptional. And I'll put it completely bluntly, without Virunga, one third of the mountain gorilla population will disappear overnight. So there's seven points for me that make Virunga um, completely unique and different to many other destinations. And it's the oldest national park in Africa. It was established in 1925 with the primary reason to protect mountain gorillas of which today they protect exactly one third, almost three or just over 300 mountain gorillas exist in the national park on the DRC side. Um, it exists in an eco region called the Albertine Rift. And now the Albertine Rift is basically an ecological island that is, you know, at high altitude, that's pretty much remained intact throughout different climate periods. So it survived aeons. And as a result, you know, Virunga National Park, the Albertine Rift, Rift has over 40% of all mammals that occur in Africa live in and around Virunga National Park. And so it's no surprise that it's the most biologically diverse region in Africa. I mean, in the central region, there's still lions that call in the savannah sector. There's papyrus swamps, river systems, you know, Afromontane forest. It's truly, truly unique. And then you add to this Nirugongo volcano. It's the largest active lava lake on Earth. It's quite something. Right next door to it is another amazing volcano called Nyamalagura, which is a shield volcano, quite different to the stratovolcano of um, Nirugongo. And it's also in and out of very active phases, um, eruptions and lava. And Virunga, it has the largest ranger force in Africa, about 720 people, rangers, men and women, protect um, the park in the line of as being ecological custodians. And the craziest part about all of this is that 4 million people live just within a day's walk of the park. So you can imagine the challenges they face. Three things that really make Virunga what it is and as powerful as it is. And that's obviously the wildlife, the gorilla experience. It's, it's completely um, an amazing thing. 
And then there's the conservation aspect. And then, of course, like I mentioned earlier, the volcano. A lot of guests, you know, friends, people ask me, Carl, you know, how, what is Virunga like? What, you know, can you explain it to us? And the, it's, it's, so, it's so difficult to put in words. And really the best way for me to explain it is once you see it, you can never unsee it. And it really will change the way you travel forever. It's that powerful. If you travel to Africa again after you've been to Virunga, your whole, your, the whole paradigm and your, your, everything will shift. Um, in the way you travel again in the future. For those that have been in the presence of mountain gorillas, you know, I am personally, I think this is one of the only experiences which makes us as humans feel very, very small and being in front of a massive male silverback will really send shivers down your spine. It's quite intimidating, but it's truly, truly spectacular. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. Lisa's going to go into a little bit more detail about this um, a little bit later. But the proximity that you, you know, you, you have with the gorillas is, it, it's, it's extraordinary. To be within a few meters, five, seven, ten meters of these gorillas, it's truly remarkable. And then you add the volcano. This is my wife and I, Ruth, in December 2017, when we summited uh, Nuragonga for the first time. After seven hours trekking to the top, I mean, when you look down into this caldera, there's there's nothing that you can say. It takes the words out of your mouth completely. And then you sleep on top of the volcano and this is what it's like. You literally have dinner in a tiny little montane cabin um, and then you come out, you know, and you're looking into this burning caldera, taking photographs of the lava lake, listening to the rumbling. It's, it's, it's quite something. But for me, what I enjoy one of the things I enjoy the most about the volcano is that the last 300 meters um, of uh, when you when you summit the volcano, you enter a very unique vegetation zone called the Afro-Alpine zone. And basically, this zone is only achievable on very few other massive peaks in Africa. One of the easier ones is Kilimanjaro, but this is going to take you seven days to get to the zone. Um, so being able to see these giant lobelias and the giant ground zills within a day's walk on top of Nyiragongo, it's, um, it makes the experience that much better. And then, of course, there's the conservation aspect. Now, if you come to Virunga, you're going to come with the anticipation to see gorillas. You're going to come and you're going to want to see the volcano. I promise you now, you're going to leave with the conservation side, taking steel in the limelight in the show completely. It's really that that powerful. All of these factors sound incredible, but the crazy part is that it's one of the most difficult and most challenging areas in the world, really, um, to protect. Um, there's just, you know, the Great Lakes region has had such a massive population of people for so long, um, it poses a huge challenges. And you can see here an example of how fragile this ecosystem is. This is Pretty much where you would be walking en route to start your gorilla trekking on the left is the semi-intact kind of pioneering part of the forest. And on the right hand side, you have plowing fields, vegetable fields, and this is where the people in the area get their food from. So, I mean, you, you cannot take that away from the people, but it's a good idea how, how fragile it is because there's absolutely no buffer zone between the, the, the habitat types. And it's not impossible for a gorilla to wander out of this forest and come and feed on the, you know, the beans and the crops that the people are growing. So very fragile. You know, with all of this, it is also one of the places that has so much hope. I mean, I'll give you one example. There's hundreds and hundreds, but you know, with the rebel groups in the region, one of their biggest things is to take control over the, the charcoal trade or control the charcoal trade, which cuts down the old hardwood trees in Virunga. Um, and within the next 10 years, Virunga, through their pioneering, you know, hardly seen in Africa, hydroelectric power plants, they plan to provide power to 1 million people within, um, within and around the national park. So that's just one of the aspects, you know, of the incredible work that Virunga is doing as an outcome, biodiversity conservation is a result. Last year, I guided two lovely guests who have become very good friends over the last few years, Nev and Viv from Australia. They joined us this morning on our successful talk um, at 11 o'clock. 
And this is where I met Lisa. Um, she was in Virunga running, or basically on a bit of a reconnaissance trip to sell the destination in the future. And the four of us got on so well, we had the most incredible week together. And this is really where, um, you know, the relationship was formed. So I'm going to hand over to um, Lisa, who's going to be taking us through a little bit about what the experience is like on the ground as a, as a traveler. Right, everyone, thanks for joining in again. Um, I'm going to be taking you on a gorilla trek this afternoon. And the only three, three things you're going to need to come with me, your hiking boots, one of these, which you're obviously all getting used to wearing, and a good sense of adventure. So it was always my dream to see the fairy golds of Warunga, the third piece in my mountain gorilla puzzle. So last year when a gap presented itself, I found myself being escorted through the Gorma land border post by Innocent, um, who you will be getting to meet later. Admittedly, I was a bit nervous, but from the moment I cleared over from Rwanda into the DRC and met up with Kyle Nevin Viv, I realized that this was going to be no ordinary adventure. So access into the DRC, the quickest and easiest way is into uh, Kigali, Rwanda, a three and a half, four hour drive down to Goma, where Lake Kivu sits. And you can either cross over on the same day, spend a night, and the following day you cross over into the DRC. Um, once you book a trip, we take care of your visa, so that's all done. Um, with the Virunga head office at the Grand Barrier border post, all you need is a valid visa, a yellow fever certificate. It's a quick, easy, and painless process. Probably one of the easiest through any border post that I've been. So depending where you're going, Kyle, you need to go back one. Um, sorry, 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 my bad. <laughs> um, so after border post formalities, you're gonna set off. The Barungas National Park in total is 7,800 square kilometers. For gorilla tracking, we focus on the, the southeastern part. You can see there's a light green area with yellow circles. That's called the Bukima region of the park. And there are three tracking points, Jomba, Bukima, and Kibumba. We sorry, I don't really want, we cannot see the, the presentation. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt what you're saying, no. but we cannot see the presentation. Okay, um, Anya. Um, let me just, okay, just. We saw it earlier. We saw it earlier, and uh, I'm sorry. No okay. Lisa, Kyle, we can see it. Really? Yeah. Maybe we have to share yeah, content. We, we okay. can see it. Sorry, Lisa. Um, okay, I think, Anya, if anything, my only, <laughs> okay, I see it too. So, Anya, I think the only issue there might be connectivity. Um, I think okay. pretty much... Can I make a suggestion? If you go to speaker view rather than gallery view, that might help. Okay. Um... So in the top right hand corner, if you if you uh, yes. to, to if you more. turn turn off turn off um, uh, turn off full screen, and in the top right hand corner, if you hover over that, then there's an option to switch between gallery and um, and speaker view. And if you select speaker view, then you'll see the screen. Uh, there we go. Okay. Anya, just let us know if that works for you. I'm, I'm not so sure it is, but why don't you just continue and then we can maybe look at the presentation later. Ah, got it. Oh, got it. Got, got, it. It. got, it. got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Cheers. sorry. No problem. No, thanks for letting us know. It's good that we know because we want all of you to be able to see. Thanks for uh, Anya and Phil. Sorry, okay, Lisa. So to carry on, we, we did both our trips in the Bukima section of the park, um, which is home to eight habituated families or bands of gorillas, of which five are habituated to visitors, which allows us to go and view them. Uh, Kipumba's got three and Jomba two. Um, so yeah, we, we trek in the Bukima region of the park. How it works, and which is very different to the other areas being Rwanda and uh, Uganda, is that in um, the Virunga, they're very conservation oriented. There you can see um, the layout of all the different gorilla groups. If, for example, the first day we walked Rugendo group, which has 10 gorillas. If there are 10 or less in the group, they only allow four people to visit those gorillas a day. If there are 10 or more members in the family, for example, Kaparizi, 
there are a maximum of six people. So already your numbers visiting those guerrilla groups are far less than the other two countries, and it makes for a far more exclusive and relaxed experience. The other bonus about Rwanda is the price of the permits. High season, you're paying $400 per permit per hour, and that allows you to one hour of guerrilla viewing from the time you locate those guerrillas. Off season, which they throw in depending on when they need people, it goes down to $200 per permit per hour, which is a fraction of what you're paying in the other two countries. So that itself is a bit of a bonus. Um, again, the age limit is 15 years of age. Value for money, you can't compare. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the tracking. On the day, uh, we stayed at uh, Bukima. The lodge is literally a three minute walk to the ranger post where you're gonna check in for the day. You're gonna get your briefing by the head guide. He's going to sanitize your hands, take your temperature, and give you a face mask. Um, before you leave, recommended to take a porter. It's the best investment apart from your gorilla permit on the day. As you can see in this picture, they carry your stuff, they push, they pull you. But most of all, you are directly assisting the vulnerable communities that live around the park. So without us, these guys aren't getting work. Um, and they just make your trekking a whole lot easier. So yeah, you hire a porter and off you go. And depending on the gorilla group that you're assigned, it might be a 10 minute walk from the headquarters, or as you could see, we worked, walked about 46 minutes flat into the forest and we found the gorillas. Um, so yeah, once you get there uh, and you, what happened is before we depart the ranger post, the advance guards have already gone out to start tracking the gorillas from where they've woken up. They're in communique with our head guide, and he takes us into the forest, the closest point to where they left the gorillas the night before. Gorillas go to sleep like we do. They wake up at sunrise, and they start looking for food, and they'll follow the silverback in whichever direction he decides to go. So yeah, you, we walked along the forest edge, cut in, and found the gorillas, and then it's one hour with the Virunga showstoppers. And as Kyle said, anyone that's seen a gorilla, you're mesmerized in the first 10 minutes, it takes your breath away. I've done it 70 times, I still get butterflies. You still stand there, you're seeing something that looks into your, straight through your eyes, and it is one of the most phenomenal experiences, wildlife experiences Africa has to offer. Um, a humbling experience, a unique experience. It's just really fantastic to see them go about their normal life. Here you see a silverback. They, they walk past you. Obviously, if there's a strict seven meter distance between you and the gorillas, that's solely because they have a very low immune system. At the moment, it's all panic stations because of COVID-19. But if they walk past you and they're going somewhere, you stand still and they carry on. But the general distance is seven meters. And I have a very good feeling once we resume tracking, it could be 10 or more, solely because they just don't have an immune system to us. Here you can see Verve with her face mask on. It's the only country apart from West Africa, lowland gorillas, where it is absolutely mandatory to wear a face mask. No, no discussion, you will not be allowed in. You can't take it off. They take their conservation of their gorillas very seriously. So yeah. Um, you can see how close you're getting. And, and for me, the incredible thing is um, one minute you're staring or staring, sh sharing stares with the most phenomenal creature on earth. And in the next day, five and a half hours later, you're being mesmerized by a crater lake that is just beyond words. I mean, you're crying looking at the gorillas. You get to the top of this volcano. It is simply one of the finest experiences I've ever had. Tough hike. But once you get there, it's amazing. Um, people ask me, so what is the accommodation like in the Virungas? Uh, this is the dining area in Kipumba, which is actually the closest um, point to the border post. Um, there are three different lodges at the moment. Kipumba, you've got Makeno Lodge, and the brand new flagship camp for Virunga National Park is called Ngila, and that's about to open near the Bukima Ranger Post. And all three of these lodges, you literally roll out of bed, either walk to the headquarters or the views from the, the porch or front deck of the active volcano are simply breathtaking. Um, a complete highlight of any journey just to sit there with a sundowner and look at these views. 
So yeah, and then we, after our gorilla trekking, we continued to Rumangaba, which is where the park headquarters are for the entire Virunga National Park. This to me was a phenomenal experience, minimum one day, if not two. And once you enter this enclosed area, which is quite large, they have a variety of things you can do. This is one of four orphan gorillas, which is being homed in a Sinkwekwe center, which also happens to be the only place in the world that has been able to um, keep alive four orphan gorillas. As you know, gorillas, mountain gorillas do not survive outside of the forest solely because they are uh, the familial bonds or the food that they eat. We don't know what they eat, but this sanctuary has been able to keep these four infants alive. Some of them are now quite big, phenomenal experience. They take you in and you can just stand there all day and watch what goes on. Um, this, the headquarters is also the most beautiful, these old buildings. You can walk around at leisure. This is exactly where everything takes place. Um, beautiful historical buildings um, within the area. Waiting for a slide, Kyle. Um, you can go on nature walks. There's phen phenomenal birding, primates. The chimps come through. The one day we were chasing chimps. Um, beautiful habitat, butterflies, birds. They all, it's also home to the Congo hounds. Here's Christian and his two dogs. You can go to where the dogs are kept. I kept sneaking off, the dogs were howling and giving it away, but you see how they train these dogs. You see them going out on missions. It's a phenomenal experience to see how these dogs work and, and what they tell you about their missions and what they actually do in the forest. So yeah, that was a real highlight for me was seeing these Congo hounds and also um, the Cocker Spaniel and what role he fills. In 2007, there was a terrible um, massacre of nine mountain gorillas. They are all buried at Rumangabo. Here is the sign to the cemetery. It's a very sombering experience, but you can go there and each gorilla has got a plaque. It's, you know, their respect to their gorillas is, is beyond anything I've seen in either of the other two countries. Walking around and just enjoying what the, the area has to offer. Um, yeah, and to end it, um, the guys that make it really happy happen. From the moment we left the um, the Grand Barrier Border Post, we were assigned to this phenomenal team. Whenever we left, they were with us. Uh, they shared their stories. They welcomed us to their home, um, and and they are what Congo is about and the Barunga National Park. And you know, their love for the animal and animals and the wildlife comes through every day when they take you out. I never once felt insecure with them, you know, and yeah, and these are the people that give me hope that what they do will continue to conserve the area and make Virunga what it is. So yeah, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to my compatriot Innocent, and he's going to take you through behind the scenes and tell you a little bit more about the people and boots on the ground. Thank you, Innocent. Thanks, Lisa. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for your partnership and make this to happen. Since my journey in tourism and conservation has started in uh, 2006. Eno, can you make it louder? Can you hear me? It's very soft. Can you make it louder, Eno? Hello. Just stand by everyone. Yeah, Innocent, is your speaker by any chance, is there anything in the way of your speaker if you're using your laptop, if it's a new laptop or a phone? Hello, Hello. can you hear me? Yeah, Innocent, we can hear you. The only thing is it's, it's, a, it's very, very low. If that's, if that's all we have, it's okay. But are you using uh, your new laptop? Okay. Yeah, Innocent, I think then that, that's great. At least we've got you here and the signal is good. If you don't mind just to try and speak maybe a little bit louder and then for everyone that is listening, if you can just put the volume up on your laptops as loud as possible, then I think it'll work. It'll work fine. Thanks, you know. Okay.
Yeah. No, innocent. It, it it it's it won't make a difference if you change your volume because it's basically you talking into the mic. Um, I think innocent. I think let's try go ahead, my man. And then what we'll do is, if you don't mind, to just try and talk as loud as possible. Um, and then and then we'll all just on up our, our computers. We'll just put the volume up as loud as we can. Okay, let me try and make good headset. Okay, no problem. No worries. Is this okay? There we go. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Nice. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for this time. No problem. Yeah. Thanks. So again, I thank uh, everyone for joining us. Uh, it's uh, an opportunity for me to share my information, news, and experience I had with the Park Rangers. Uh, the first time I've been to Congo, it was, uh, I was 10 years old when I was a refugee during the genocide of 1994. Uh, but then later, science, I, my journey in tourism and conservation started in 2006. I had the opportunity to meet and work together with Virunga Park Rangers during my day job as a tourist guide. I know some of them before they become park rangers because we studied together at the University of Tourism and Natural Conservation, which is not far from uh, Virunga National Park. I remember when I was nominated to be one of uh, student leader, I thought well, this was a difficult responsibility but not at all. It was a great moment to discover different dreams of young people like me, including those who are uh, rangers. I learned a lot and get motivated by my colleagues who always came to ask me how they can become rangers or be tourist guides. Everyone knew that Virunga is dangerous it's a dangerous place to walk in because of insecurity, but it wasn't enough reason to give up. Many of my friends and colleagues have joined proudly and became Virunga Park Rangers. I really appreciate all the job, great job they are doing. There are other alternatives to look jobs somewhere else, but for them, they decide to sacrifice their life. I was much inspired by their strong determination to become rangers so that they can save gorillas and other wildlife for next generations. Without looking at the challenge, Virunga Park rangers have been friendly, welcoming everyone and stand strongly to their vision of nature and wildlife protection. Sadly, today we are remembering those heroes who lost their lives while trying to protect our biodiversity. They did what they had to do, and now it's our time to do our best so that Virunga wildlife and surrounding community are protected. I would like to invite everyone, join us to help the widow and children of foreign rangers. Again, the success of Virunga protection is not a profit for surrounding community only, but the entire world will enjoy it. I'd like to say that uh, conservation is life, and that's why me and you, we are having now a mission. We have a mission to encourage with meaningful support those rangers who, con who continue to patrol and carry out their mission, protecting the outstanding biodiversity of the park and the local people living in the surrounding area. So now give me uh, 
an opportunity uh, to show you and take you around uh, Virunga National Park. Already we have uh, this picture. As you see, uh, this is a village of Rumangavo, uh, very close to uh, Park Rangers headquarters. Many Park Rangers are recruited from villages like this and the surrounding area or Goma city. I'll go next. Yeah, Innocent, it's, I think there might be a small delay, but I did go over to the next one. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Chukudu. A wooden bike locally handmade vehicle in the Virunga area. It's an important tool that most of the young people use for transporting their crops and heavy loads. And it's uh, one of the best way also they can earn money. Uh, here we have uh, portals interacting with uh, visitors on mountain Niragongo. Park rangers also play a huge role in the local economy by creating job, jobs like tourist guiding, porter, driver, food supplier, and sharing tourism revenue through small projects black school, water, electricity, and agriculture. So as you see the truck, Uh, it's carrying uh, charcoals. So charcoal trade run by rebel groups make about 30 to 35 million of US dollars to serve their own interest. This makes zero profit to the people surrounding the uh, Virunga National Park and we cannot compare while tourism profit are uncountable and shareable to the community and to the economy of the whole country. While waiting for the next picture, I would like to inform you that by 2030, Virunga Alliance aims to generate 105 megawatts by hydroelectric power and serve 1 million households and small medium enterprises with clean energy. So this makes a sense that we couldn't tolerate and the world should stand up to stop all people doing illegal activity in the Virunga National Park. Here you see uh, some of the park rangers and gorilla truckers on their daily activity. They are inside of Django, Virunga National Park. They do all 
their job with a great love. They love being who they are. And all achievements in conservation and tourism success rely on their great job. I call everyone stand up and unite to fight any kind of violence and injustice. Uh, we have uh, a team of park rangers. I would like to inform you that those are not military. They are not soldiers. Virunga park rangers don't have a status of armed force. They don't work to serve a political interest of any particular party. So there is no any reason why armed group, rebel groups should continue to harass and kill biologists, our conservationists, our wildlife protector. Okay, can you go next? Yeah, I've just gone next to the widow slide, Innocent. Maybe it's just a small delay with you, but it's okay, no problem. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. So, as I said, uh, we have a mission to accompany the rangers in their mission, but also to help in all possible ways, the families, friends, and their children who are left behind, but uh, join also Virunga authority to support those widow and children of foreign rangers. We are, and we should be committed to encourage and support those who committed to sacrifice their lives and serve by diversity in Africa's old national park. Almost to the end, I would like to, as uh, other presenters have mentioned, Virunga is very rich, and Virunga has all about uh, biodiversity. I believe we all have a common mission to protect our planet and keep it safe. And Virunga is one of the important elements everyone should be taking care and contribute in his way so that we can save and have um, live this planet, especially Virunga, much better for next generations. Every day we have to think what is our contribution. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, there is no any reason that our own common world heritage, we still have active rebel armed group, including those genociders who made 1994 Tutsi genocide in Rwanda, who continue killing innocent people and recently killed 17 Congolese civilians and park rangers. We are, that we are remembering today. However, whoever kills an innocent life, it is as, is as if he has killed all of humanity. I would like to invite uh, everyone to take uh, this opportunity and we give, we just for a short time of a silence to commemorate those heroes who lost their life while protecting the weird life in Virunga National Park. Thank you. Thank you.
Innocent, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a, it's a truly unique honor for us to hear something like that from someone like you who's grown up in the area and has created an amazing company, a tourism company for yourself to try and support and be an ambassador for, for this region too. And we, we would like to invite everyone if they would like to join in in helping these, these families of the fallen rangers um, who are pretty much the breadwinners um, in an area where job diversity and job opportunity is incredibly low. And so what we've put together is a, is a beautiful little donation booklet, which we'll be sending to everyone via email. I'll also leave um, the holding screen on the end with our details um, for those that would like um, the booklet to have a look through it and with all of the relevant details to try and help. Um, and included in that is a selection of, of images that I've taken personally in the past, a selection of images that Lisa's taken in Virunga, and then beautiful charcoal portraits um, by a South African artist, Penny Simpson. So I'll just run through these slides with you quickly. This is all in the, the booklet that we'll be sending to everyone. We were quite fortunate to have sold this image on our morning's um, presentation, so we're truly grateful for that. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much the end of the story that the three of us would like to tell. And thank you all to, yeah, thanks to all of you for taking this time. Um, in the morning for those that have joined, for the many of those that have joined from, from the east and west coast of America and for those in South Africa and Europe, um, thank you all for, for joining in today. Um, I will leave this running for a few more minutes. I see that there were a few questions that did come in during our talk. Um, if there's anyone that would like to um, type in any questions, please feel free. If there's anyone that would like to, um, you know, put the video on and, and, and ask a question, feel free to do so. Um, running through the, the questions, um, I did see what bird is that? That's called a gray-throated barbet. It's a very, very unique barbet. It's got these little protuberances on above the nose. It's, um, it's a, a unique bird belonging to the Gymnobuco genus. Um, and there's only a few of these barbets in the whole of Africa that have these strange protrusions on their nose. And they're very common in and around McKenna Lodge um, in Virunga. They sort of coexist with the long-tailed starlings um, in the nests and dead trees around the camp. So quite a beautiful bird. The other question is, are there chimpanzees in Virunga? Um, they do occur within the region for sure. It's the eastern chimpanzee, um, the Schweinfurti subspecies. And there is actually a program that they have at the moment to habituate chimpanzees in and around um, McKenna Lodge. Um, they semi-habituated, the viewing is touch and go, but I mean, I've had, and Lisa and I actually last year had pretty amazing views almost right outside the Congo Hound um, compound. So, and that's a completely wild group of chimps that comes um, for safe refuge in and around the headquarters. Um, Lisa, yeah, there's a few questions here. When is the best time to go and then how soon do you think it'll restart? I don't know if you want to... Um, can't really say. I mean, between COVID and then reopening, I think hopefully sometime this year. We don't know. As soon as flights can start going in and, and borders open, I guess that's going to encourage tourism. So I think until we're up in the sky, no one really knows. Um, yeah. When are the best times to go? If you want... High Lava Lake, they say during the rainy season, April, May, that's the clearest view of the caldera, if you want to go and have a look at that. Um, we went in July, there were issues with the um, lava coming up, and luckily on the day we went, it had come up, 
Um, we didn't encounter, so June, July, August, September, dry season. Then you have the short rains, October, November. Then it goes back into dry season. So you'll probably find November's a low season um, and April and May. Just depends what you want. Um, we didn't have any rain when we were there, which was July, towards the end of July. Beautiful weather. Yeah. And then, and then there's a, yeah, thanks, Lisa. There's, um, uh, so Innocent, if, if you're there, there's a question, while tourism is, uh, to the area is limited, how are the rangers and other staff members of the park going to be supported? Hello? You're there, yeah, we copy you, you know? Hello, yeah, yeah, we see. Uh... I think I tried to mention how everyone uh, can do all the best to contribute. As now, uh, tourism is temporarily closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, yeah, you understand it's a big challenge to Virunga National Park and they need support from all of us. Again, as you saw, the most important, I would say in two uh, ways. The first thing is that the UN and all uh, institutions that may take a decision to help Virunga for stability and peace, that will be one for the solution so that maybe in the future we may have tourism uh, running and bringing a lot of income, as I said, uh, what the profit that tourism can bring is much bigger than what these uh, rebel tour guys are getting. But at the moment, as now, uh, it's a big challenge, and I think Virunga can first try to uh, survive using some of their savings and uh, some contribution from the government, uh, which I don't think is enough. Uh, but mainly uh, Virunga will survive uh, thanks to each and every one of us giving his contribution. So you can contribute in giving a support uh, that Virunga can, that can help Virunga to manage and to pay for the rangers and Great, Thank, thanks, other innocent. stuff. I don't know if I respond well to the question. That's perfect, Innocent. Thanks very much. Yeah, I think it, it answers another question here, which is, you know, um, which was... Um, you know, how much does the state contribute to the park or is it all outside funding? Um, there is a Congolese um, conservation organization called the ICCN, which is um, works alongside Virunga National Park. The unique thing about Virunga um, as with many new conservation parks in Africa, um, is that it's something called a PPP, which is a public-private pi partnership. And so they work hand in hand with the, the public sector of the DRC, but they have the private um, sort of a power to manage um, infrastructure um, and, and the operation on the ground. So a lot of the funding is, um, of course, um, um, depends on, on external funding. Um, but there is a marginal funding that does come from within the country. Um, and then guys, so I, f I forgot one thing is that this morning to the two guests, which you have seen um, in, in a lot of these images, Nevin Viv, um, they, mm -hmm. I actually put them uh, on a little bit of a spotlight and asked them to just share a little bit about Virunga. And so they were completely unprepared. Um, I did subsequently ask them to, um, put a video together with me, which ended up being almost midnight in Australia because it was such a lovely um, insight to hear um, from a guest perspective. Lisa and I are part guides, part sort of tourism operators, as well as innocent, you know, mm -hmm. a, a tourism operator growing up in the area. And then to have heard this as well from from a from a, a traveller in the region was quite unique. So it's a it's a minute video. I'm just going to play through you. And then um, we'll be we'll be closing shortly thereafter. Okay, oh, yeah. okay. Sorry, Lisa. Okay, hold on one second. Um, new share. Um, okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. 
Sorry, guys, let's just get in the audio right. There we go. Hello, I'm Neville Bryant. In July 2019, my wife Vivian and I were privileged to travel to the DRC and visit Virunga National Park. We were travelling with Kyle and met up with Lisa, and you will have seen a number of images on the presentation tonight. Whilst the DRC and Virunga have been facing a number of challenges from guerrilla insurgents and Ebola, at no stage during our trip did we feel at all threatened. We were met at the border in Goma and fully escorted for the duration of the trip to both the mountain guerrillas and for the climb up the volcano. This is a testament to the fantastic job that the rangers do in protecting the endangered mountain guerrillas and their valuable clients. Travelling to Virunga is an amazing, life-changing experience. We had travelled to Africa on numerous occasions, but Virunga leaves an indelible impression on you and completely recalibrates your expectations of safaris. The tragedy of the recent rebel incursion left Viv and I totally devastated. The tra the, it is a tragic blow for the dedicated team who manage and protect Virunga National Park. As fellow travellers and nature lovers, I implore you to firstly support the families of the fallen rangers and secondly, to make plans to visit this amazing place as soon as current restrictions are lifted. Only with this kind of support can Virunga survive and continue to protect this invaluable natural resource. The struggle must continue. Congratulations to Kyle, Lisa and Innocence on this great initiative to raise awareness of this tragic event and to promote the long-term survival of Virunga. Thank you. Um, I just see one uh, answer from Julie Williams, who's on this talk as well. She's the head of tourism in Virunga. She's answered a question from earlier, 703 bird species. So Julie, thanks very much for, for getting back to us with that. Um, and I think if we... If we're good, guys, thank you all so very much for, for joining once again. It's been an honor. And um, yeah, hopefully one day we can all share this great destination um, together. Um, thank you also very much, Lisa and Innocent in particular. Yeah, thanks for, um, for your contribution. Yeah, thank you for taking the time, everyone, for getting up early and yeah, sharing the experience and the hope with us for Virunga National Park. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clive. Thanks, Brian Thank you. and Dick. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. joining, everyone. Have a good weekend. You too. Keep Stay safe. Fit. Keep getting fit for your gorilla tracking. You're going to need it. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great, guys. In case I'm gonna... you need our emails, that's it. They're there. The glasses goes off. Yep. Great. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to end the meeting. Thanks, Lisa. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Richard.